It's 536 and we're going to get this evening's town hall started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Injustice Watch's town hall on criminal justice reform legislation here in Illinois. My name is Juliette Sorensen and I'm the and I'm the executive director of Injustice Watch, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, nonpartisan journalism organization that conducts in-depth research exposing institutional failures that obstruct justice and equality. I'll be co-moderating tonight's discussion along with my colleague, Adeshina Emanuel. Ade. Hey, so I'm the Editor-in-Chief in Injustice Watch. My name is Adeshina Emanuel, and I wanna thank everyone for being here with us tonight. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. So this is how we're gonna proceed. And I'm gonna give folks a bit of background about the questions that Ade and I will be posing to Senator Peters and Public Defender Sharon Mitchell. Uh, prior to the event, we reached out to a wide range of community-based organizations that have constituents, serve communities, and stakeholders that have a vested interest in criminal justice reform and the criminal process here in Illinois. We asked them to uh, seek feedback among their stakeholders and submit questions about criminal justice and public safety in Illinois uh, to our town hall participants tonight. It's those questions that Ade and I will be asking along with some questions of our own, um, but we wanna leave time for your questions as well. And so our plan is to wrap up those community-based questions that we previously received around 6.30 and spend the rest of our time with Senator Peters and Sharon Mitchell uh, posing questions from you in the audience. Um, to do that, I ask that you please put your, quest your question in writing in the Q&A function that you're gonna see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Ade and I will be moderating that Q&A. There's no reason to wait until the end of our discussion. If a question occurs to you during the discussion, please feel free to put it in the Q&A and we're gonna do our very best to get to it before the evening ends. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two town hall participants. With us, we have Sharon Mitchell. Sharon is the public defender of Cook County. He served in that role since April 1 of this year. Sharon comes to the office from the Illinois Justice Project, which is a policy reform org dedicated to supporting people, programs, and policies that can help reduce inappropriate incarceration, improve community safety outcomes, and reduce recidivism and increase justice in the legal system. Mitchell began his legal career in the law office of the Cook County Public Defender. He first worked as a clerk in law school and later as an assistant public defender with assignments in the civil, first municipal, and felony trial divisions. Now for Robert Peters, who is a member of the Illinois Senate, appointed to represent the 13th district in January 2019 to replace outgoing Senator Kwame Raul. The name might ring a bell to you all, our current attorney general in Illinois. And uh, Peter successfully ran for re-election in 2020. He's still here. In October 2020, uh, Peters introduced the bill along with Representative Justin Slaughter to end the use of cash bill in Illinois, later known um, as the Safety Act, um, or rather, that was part of the Safety Act. Um, he served as the inaugural chair of the Senate Special Committee on Public Safety and is the chair of its Black Caucus. Now, I think we'll move on to the first question, Juliet, um, which- Yeah, that's all is, you are, Yeah, which I think is a obvious question. It might seem a little silly, but you know, why should we care? You know, um, why should we care about what happens in Springfield around police and criminal justice reform, which is something that is often a very Chicago centric conversation where people are looking to the mayor, the, the alder people um, and other folks to sort of uh, act. So why should we care about what happens in Springfield around police and criminal justice reform? Um, Robert, um, I'd like to kick off. Yeah, so I think the, the first part is um, the reason why I think uh, people should care is um, 
it's the place where we write laws that impact um, everybody. Um, you know, when it comes to implementation, that's a little bit more of a complicated question. And I think we're going to end up digging deeper on that. Uh, but it's also an area of opportunity for us to really write laws and create transformative change. Um, and oftentimes when we talk about Springfield and we talk about the Illinois legislator, um, it usually comes up either something really bad um, uh, or otherwise very rarely. Um, and yet what we're seeing come out of Springfield and the General Assembly has been a series of transformative pieces of legislation that show a unique organizing opportunity to create real change. But most people don't really pay attention to it. Um, I think that part of that is the fact that Springfield's three and a half hours away from Chicago. Um, your access to it is limited. Um, the press, not necessarily you all, but uh, aren't necessarily down there like they used to be. Uh, and City Hall is right there in your back door. Seems easier to be able to control, easier to be able to access. But fundamentally, Springfield's the place where we write laws on, on especially a macro level. Uh, and it's also a place in which those laws have been able to be passed. Um, I, I, I am of the opinion that not enough people know what I do on a day to day. I feel it is very important to tell people what I do on a day to day and to tell especially organizers to focus on Springfield more and more uh, because it is a spot where we have real opportunity and we've seen a lot of things happen, which we've talked about with like the Safety Act and, um, uh, and a whole host of other bills where I would actually say that there is a greater opportunity for progressive pieces of legislation to get done in Springfield than there are in City Hall right now. Um, and not a lot of people are focusing on that. And so to me, I would say the reason why people should care, there's the technical technocratic reason, but fundamentally in terms of power and policy, Springfield is an area of opportunity and people need to go out there and, and make it happen. And we're like, we, what made us be able to pass, especially any cash bond, um, and I'll turn over to Sharon, is that we had a unique coalition that combined a variety of different stakeholders from people who organize on the ground and excuse my language, I'm a curse, they'll fuck you up with some direct action. Uh, you have the electoral power piece, you have the policy piece, you have the legislators, and you have people who are doing the direct, doing that direct lobbying, that one-on-one -on -one conversation to legislators. And that combination of things is something that is, I think, special. I think it's a model that people, not just here in Illinois, but across the country can take up. And I think is an area of opportunity for so much that we can get done in terms of the state of Illinois. Thank you, Sharon. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, and I, first off, I apologize for being in the car. I know it's annoying. I, I got my timing mixed up just a little bit, but thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, I think this is a great question and I think it's really clear. Um, the criminal code is written in Springfield. Uh, the laws that govern uh, who goes to prison, uh, how long they go to prison, why they go to prison uh, are written in Springfield. So uh, when we wanted to significantly limit the power of the state to incarcerate people pre-trial and to take money away from folks' families, we needed to change the criminal code. And that's what we did. And you could only change that in Springfield. So while it has not always been a hotbed, especially when we're talking about police reform, when we're talking about legal uh, changes to the legal code, it has to happen in Springfield. The vast majority of people who are in prison are in state prisons. Uh, and that's where you got to change the law. So that's where we went. Thank you, um, Juliet. You want to take it from here? Yeah, thank you, Adi. So, Sharon and Robert, I, I, I want to focus a little more on, uh, a little more narrowly on, on the portions of the Safety Act that deal with bond reform. Um, and I'm going to ask you two questions that are closely linked. And these questions were submitted to us by the Civic Federation. So uh, the first question uh, is, and, and you know, Sharon, I'm, 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 let me, let me clarify a little bit about the, the way I, I, I hope you might answer these questions for our audience. You know, Robert was there when, when the sausage is made, so to speak. He can speak about the legislation itself, about the impact he hopes that it'll have. But you, you, know, you, you and your office are now going to see it translated into practice. And I'd really like that public defender's perspective about how this is going to impact 
your clients and the work that your office does. So here goes. The pretrial portions of the Safety Act make changes to the process in the way release decisions are made, including allowing law enforcement to issue citations instead of arrest, and requiring the court to hold a detention hearing in order to get someone in jail pre-trial. How different will the new pre-trial release process be from the current practice? And if you could highlight the key ways in which it will be different from your perspective. And Robert, let's start with you. Yeah, can, can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time? I apologize. No, that's okay. Key differences. I, I, I apologize, keep, keep going. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so key differences um, in terms of the pretrial detention process and outcomes now, and once that aspect of the Safety Act is implemented. Yeah, I think the, the one that really sort of stands out to me is that we have a system that creates this sort of plea deal machine, um, which is basically overrunning the court. And I think Sharon knows this when it comes to public defenders. Uh, and gets people stuck into situations where they take plea deals uh, to be able to go back home to their family or to take on their job. And a part that really sort of sticks out to me is like giving people their, their day in court um, that I think is so vitally important. So um, instead of having to be locked up simply because you, you can't afford to, um, it narrows that down uh, based off of threat um, in terms of someone being detained and otherwise people being able to go home and live their life. Uh, on top of that, there are sort of other pieces about this that if someone, for example, misses their court date, they don't have a warrant issued out for the arrest immediately. Um, the ability for cops uh, to be able to, to do, uh, you know, sort of a, a summons uh, to court uh, for misdemeanors. I mean, just fundamentally, it changes uh, the court system that isn't about overloading our jails simply because people are poor, but focusing on threat and not allowing what has been, I think, a dangerous and horrible plea deal machine that locks people into horrible, horrible, horrible situations, not just them as individuals, but fundamentally uh, their family and the community. Sharon, I'd be curious about your perspective on that. And I'd also really be interested if you expect the number of cases that result in plea deals to actually decrease because of the Safety Act, as Robert indicated. Yeah, um, you know, I think the question uh, insinuates uh, uh, something that's very true: uh, that that practice eats policy uh, for dinner. But to get a better policy, to get a better practice, we need to change the policy. And what this uh, law does. In literally numerous occasions, the numerous spaces, it limits the power of the state to detain people pre-trial. And as Senator Peters talked about, that is one of the main tools of the legal system to force incarceration, to force pleas, to force people into prison. So I do expect that there will be a significant reduction in incarceration uh, after the implementation of the Safety Act and the Pretrial Fairness Act. But let's be clear, uh, we have gotten halfway there with passing the law and we need to ensure that we're implementing the law uh, in, uh, in, the, in a correct manner. And along with implementation, so there's two parts, right? There's implementation. There are people who are in the field, right? That are in the actual work that are kind of following the law that we expect it to be followed. But there are also folks on the outside, right? That are making sure that the rules that we've set out, the, the new changes are being followed, right? And part of that is kind of uh, watchdog organizations. Part of that is, is media organizations like a Justice Watch. Part of that is the organizing community, right? The organizing community has been so powerful in getting these changes. And one of the ways they were able to do it is through uh, 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 watching, right? going to trial, going to court uh, and court watching, right? Um, so actually seeing what was happening and reporting and organizing based upon what's happened uh, allowed us to make those changes, right? We radicalized people, right? People went into bond court and saw that it resembled a slave auction, right? And they talked to their friends and they talked to their family members and then they talked to their legislators and made sure that those changes would be made. So 
Um, I expect that there will be a significant reduction in uh, uh, incarceration. Uh, I think it puts public defenders in a better place uh, to actually get the trial or, or force the state's hand, uh, but it won't happen automatically. Um, and it will take oversight to make sure that what's good on paper uh, is translate to, to good practice. You know, that's actually one of the issues that Ade and I were talking about as we prepared for, for this evening's discussion, Sharon, as, as you look toward implementation of pretrial fairness, and this really, this question is for both of you, what, what are potential barriers to implementing the law as envisioned? Listen, culture, right? The, 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 the legal system is built there's so many structures in the legal system that tries to funnel us to pleas, right? Uh, the system is built to getting people to plea, right? Everybody who reads your 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 your, uh, your uh, institution uh, knows about um, jury taxes, right? This idea that uh, in the beginning of the case, if you decide that you don't want to go to trial, you can take three years of prison time, right? We don't even say the years part, we just say the number, that's how we dehumanize the process. But if you're to go to trial, right, uh, and you lose, you're gonna get 21 years, right? Things like that are built into the DNA of the system. So there are things that we're gonna have to kind of, quite frankly, beat out of the system. And, and the law gives us the opportunity to do that. Here's another example. If you go to bond court and you look at a bond hearing, the hearing happens so fast, right? About five years ago, there were studies suggested that the average hearing takes 37 seconds. You know, the hearings last much longer, like two or three minutes. And the law really, which is, un is ridiculous, and the law really puts us in a situation, the set of laws puts us in a situation where we can have better bond hearings. We're restricting the amount of people that are even eligible for pretrial detention. And for those that are, are eligible, there are high standards that need to be met because a person is innocent until proven guilty. So again, uh, there are things that are in the bill that we suggest uh, we think are going to make strong changes, but our biggest opponent and the thing that we're working on right now is kind of wringing ourselves of this broken culture of the legal system. Can I, can I add to that real quick, which I think it's, I think Sean's right. There's, there's obviously there's the cultural parts. The other parts is that there's the politics uh, around this, um, that you're, when you think about implementation or you think about anything in, ter in, for in terms of um, creating change in this manner is um, there's politics as well. And so, and what I mean by that is like, I think there are people who mean well or are gonna do well but if there are political games or a narrative or anything being done there, it can have a profound impact on implementation. And what we know is uh, in states like New York or California or anywhere where we, I mean, Cook County alone, just um, after the tw uh, 2017 order, is that uh, a game of politics can get played. And particularly, I think that there is a politics when um, we don't necessarily get to the root of public safety issues, that there's a bunch of finger pointing um, and that causes this sort of uh, unnecessary conversation that doesn't actually get to the root of public safety. And so I just think that there's also the fact that there, there, there will be, and I fundamentally believe that politics is actually part of everything. Um, I, you know, I don't uh, um, ascribe to the idea of like, there's only some politics here and then it cuts off there. There's politics in a classroom between students and there's politics when it comes to this. And we need to acknowledge that. Um, and the main part here is to be able to be as strong as we can to fight back against a politics that is not in agreement with what we've done. Um, even if let's, there, there are the fact that it is good, it might not be on the merits of whether a law is good or not, but it might be based off of whether it is good politics or not. And so I do think it's important that when we think of this implementation conversation, that we not only get the technical details right, that we get the cultural uh, things needed, but that we're also very aware that there is a host of politics. And we know particularly the politics of a courtroom uh, and the complications that go with that, um, that are being front and center. 
Yeah, thank you. And you know, the C the Civic Federation had asked a, a follow up question, which which I want to be sure to ask on their behalf. And I am going to direct this to you, Robert, regarding implementation. You know, is there any is there any oversight that can be legislated to to try to ensure some type of accountability when it comes to implementation? You know, recognizing what Sharon is saying that culture is a challenge, culture is, is a divide that we have to bridge. Um, but what, if anything, can the legislature do to, to follow up and ensure that this change is actually effectuated, that it, remain, that, that it translates into much more than just a law in the books? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean that's, that's a huge question. And it, would almost, it almost seems like a question about, um, the nature of the legislator and 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 all that. So I'm gonna try to answer this uh, in the best way I can. I think, particularly with the Safety Act, we put a lot of pieces around it in terms of implementation and accountability. But in all honesty, you're always gonna have issues with people trying to um, break away from that. And there's always opportunities to keep legislating. I think that. Uh, the legislative process is almost a continuing ongoing struggle that you just keep doing. So yeah, I think that no matter what, we got to keep pushing uh, to make sure that a, a law is implemented and honed and made better. But we also made sure that when it comes to the courts and lower ju jurisdictions or the attorney general or a whole host of things in terms of the Safety Act, that that's been put into, that's like been put into law. It's up to them to actually be able to practice it. But I think that is I think it is always the fear that someone won't follow through on implementation, but they also, there's, there's a whole host of accountability that comes up in other spaces to hold people accountable on a law. I think it's also just the fact that you are in a constant, um, you're constantly working uh, to improve and strengthen that process. I mean, I, that's just the best way to put it. It's like, um, it's one of the, I think it's one of the more boring answers and one that most people generally hate from elected people that you're constantly working to improve and strengthen something that you've worked on. But that often is the case. And so um, my hope is that uh, people do follow through and get this done. Uh, it is the law of the land uh, that if there are things that need to be worked out, we have spaces to work out uh, the processes around this in terms of implementation. Uh, and that they use those spaces in a good faith. But it's also the fact of the matter is um, policy is not blind from power. So the, again, there's always the fact that you have to have uh, truly organized power to ensure the implementation of policy. So, you know, this goes for any piece of legislation. Like oftentimes we get caught up in this sort of policy discussion that is uh, in a frictionless vacuum um, as if like that's what the conversation is about, it goes back to the conversation, back to the idea of there's always politics and there's always organizing and there's always an argument around power. And so fundamentally, I think that when we think about implementation of anything, to be honest with you, it's about the power dynamics in that space and continuing to push back on that. Um, and yes, I think there will be people who will act in bad faith. Uh, that is not something that um, would be shocking. And that's not shocking to think about almost any piece of legislation. Um, and our job is to make sure that if those that happens, that we can legislate that and that there is a working in concert with other actors to create some organized pressure and power to make sure that that is not happening. That's the best answer. It's very, I'm trying to like manage the sausage making piece of this with the idea that there's, there is, um, a sort of praxis that has to be centered and grounded that um, policies and laws just aren't like, aren't like on high, like, you know, Moby Dick and a story that happens. Like these things require truly um, strong um, and important levels of power organized around money, people, and narrative. So I know we are. Hey, Adi, let me just real quick, because I saw somebody raise their hand a moment ago. Folks in the audience, if you could put your questions in the Q and A, Ari and I will incorporate them. So yeah, I, I, I but I am I, I'm going to ignore the raised hands, but I'm not going to ignore the questions in writing in the Q and A. Thank you. Can I jump in real quick on that that piece as well? Um, let me give you a wonky answer, and let me give you kind of 
two pieces of wonk and then um, the reality. Piece of wonk number one, uh, there is massive data collection requirements in the bill that were built like, intentionally uh, to allow for uh, institutions like yourselves to kind of look at the numbers and track whether uh, we're doing this thing in the right way. I think the second kind of wonky thing is that we're seeing a real movement among, amongst the AYC to do kind of some statewide standards and having those folks kind of, if they, if they are, if they, I think that they are invested in some, uh, some strong pretrial practices. We saw that with the report that they issued just, a, a, you know, right before we pass this bill, you know, if those standards are met, I think they have a commitment to that, that's going to help us kind of make sure that this thing is implemented in the right way. But here's the reality of the situation. Let's never forget that it was organizing that built this bill, right? That it was organizing that forced the legislator's hand. It was folks like Senator Peters who came out of an organizing community who essentially organized the Senate into doing that. That same thing is going to have to happen to make sure that we're doing this thing correctly. It will have to be people demanding that we are following the rules that are ignoring the noise, right? There'll be lots of stories in institutions, um, you know, that, that will tell the story of a person who, uh, uh, you know, you know, was released and did something bad and there'll be backlash and it'll be up to that, that movement to just kind of block that out and tell the stories of thousands of others that have been harmed by pretrial incarceration. So I'm really excited to see that there's data collection I'm really excited to see that the AYC has decided that they really want to get involved in strong statewide standards. But most importantly, I'm hopeful that the strong movement that allowed for this bill uh, to turn into law uh, will ensure that this work continues in the right way. Thank you. Um, a quick follow up. I appreciate you all's answers. I do feel like we might need to be a bit more concrete. You speak of a lot of political dynamics and potential opposition and barriers, but haven't named any names and haven't spoken more directly to what the opposition's playbook is or what, I guess, um, who we're speaking about when we say, when we spoke earlier about maybe, you know, attacks on the law or res reticence about it, or even just that, these cultural sort of barriers. I mean, who are we talking about? Like, oh, I uh, can I can I go? <laughs> we we that, that, I mean we can definitely name names. Uh, listen, there are a number of people uh, who are in traditional law enforcement that will vilify this bill. We've seen the same playbook in New York. We've seen the playbook in New Jersey. We've seen the playbook in Alaska, and they will try to do a number of things, right? They'll try to, you know, one of the powerful things that the bill does is that it makes certain offenses just ineligible for pretrial detention. They will try to expand that list. There are numerous protections that allow for judges to ensure that a person uh, is eligible for detention. There are like checks. Every court date, there have to be checks. They will try to roll those back, right? There are things around electronic monitoring, things that both limit electronic monitoring, but also ensure that if you're on electronic monitoring, that counts towards your sentence. They will come after that. There are changes to the escape statute. Uh, they will come after that. And, and, you know, it is the traditional powers that believe that safety and incarceration are the same. Um, these are people that fight at, uh, fight any reform. Um, and, 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 you know, those will be the people and those are the ways they'll try to roll this bill back piece by piece, bit by bit. And we'll just have to be strong and ensure that, 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 that the, the current bill stays as strong as it is now. And that we continue to build upon it because it's not a perfect bill. Um, it did not go far enough. We still have far away to go when it comes to, or far away to go when it comes to uh, improving pretrial practices. I just want to say I love that Adi was like, I'm going to do this right now and uh, dig deep uh, and expert. Uh, but I think Sharon's point is pretty spot on. I mean, there's just a whole host of people who are committed to, um, particularly in law enforcement, but um, who are just committed to the sort of status quo of tough on crime policies. And it's not necessarily, and I, I'll be frank, it's not necessarily about public safety. Like, to be very honest with you, um, 
I always think of the uh, criminal legal system as a mirror or a reflection of a whole host of failures, both intentional and unintentional that are happening in the world around you. And so um, I think that if we, it's just people who rather not, yeah, I might not be so analytical here. It's just people like, particularly I think in law enforcement, uh, there are actually some folks in law enforcement who are supportive uh, of these um, changes, but a good chunk of them who are going to stick to the old playbook of uh, the sort of Willie Horton-esque attacks on almost any piece. I mean, Sharon went into amazing detail about it, but like any piece of the law, I mean, it could be anything as long as they fundamentally create a narrative um, and then build off that narrative and keep building off that narrative. So, I mean, I would not be shocked if um, in 2022, um, which is a, an election year, and we don't need to get into too many details, it's technically not um, like a partisan thing, but it's just the fact of politics that people try to use this as some sort of um, uh, hammer against JB or, you know, some legislator in a swing district or uh, something along those lines. And I, I also kind of laugh because a lot of those folks can't stay on that message and they might focus on, um, you know, attacking CRT or, you um, you know, talking about uh, the vax mandate. So we'll see if that is something where they try to focus on if they can, they can do that. But that's a, a, an actual real thing that means that we have to be very ready on a broader, again, organizing a narrative front um, around what that could mean in 2022. Well, you Listen, know, I, I, I'm sorry, go on, go on. You no, know, I, I was just going to say, you know, I went on a radio show just a few months ago, right? And, you know, the lead was essentially, we see incredible violence in Chicago. We just ended cash bond. Has an ending cash bond contributed to the violence that we're seeing this summer? That was the first question. And I had to remind the host that we haven't ended cash bond yet. It doesn't go into effect till January 1st, 2023, right? And that's not at normal. That's exactly what we saw in New York, right? when their law, which was much, much more conservative than our law, got put into place on January 1st, by January 2nd, there were articles about how the law had created uh, all types of bad circumstances, right? So uh, it is also kind of the traditional reactionary way on which we report on uh, justice issues and legal issues that will also be something that we'll have to worry about. And, We'll just have to be strong and, and, and realize that the vast majority of people who are in the system um, are harmed by our over-reliance on pretrial incarceration and are harmed by how much money we pull out of communities so communities that need it the most uh, through the payment of money bonds. Great. I got, since we were sharing stories about people who then talk about a law that didn't go into effect, uh, which, you know, I love it because it's it, this has like happened uh, to me just uh, last week. I was on a panel with Senator Sims, uh, Rep Slaughter, uh, and this municipal leader from downstate uh, decided to attack us over ending cash bond. And she came up with this very uh, complicated uh, story of someone who was trespassing in someone's backyard and they were swimming in a pool and they refused to leave because we ended cash bond. And I, we all had this like look of, oh, well, Technically, that hasn't gone into effect yet, uh, and yet she felt comfortable to make uh, that point and to use that attacking point. That was after I said people will do that. I literally said before that people don't even know the implementation date, and then they attack uh, parts of the bill. And then immediately after that, she clearly did not hear me say that and did that, um, which I think was also important for so many people, uh, other municipal leaders who were there at this conference, to see that actually play out right in front of them. Uh, and to see um, how disingenuous people will be when it comes to making those, those cases. And then on New York, which is always fascinating to me, is the New York Post uh, decided to run a sort of Willie Horton-esque uh, story, front page, attacking their bail reform. And they uh, put somebody on like the front page and they said he skipped bail 114 times. Uh, and someone noted that means 113 times before uh, the bail reform bill 
Um, but they decided to focus on the hard number and not on the fact that you're literally talking about people who were impacted before the bill even happened. There's just these things that you just see uh, play out throughout the rest of the country or play out in different parts of the state uh, that are used as sort of easy um, go talking points to try to attack the bill. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that, gentlemen. You know, you know, I could talk about this uh, all night, and I'm sure there's a million other questions about this. Uh, it's a big um, anchor of uh, the Safety Act, but there are other things in the Safety Act, uh, and there are other things that aren't in the Safety Act. So I'm going to move on and uh, ask this question from a community group, the Prison Neighborhood and Arts Project. Um, so this question reads that truth and sentencing policies require those convicted and sentenced to prison to serve at least 85% of their court and post sentence and often result in inmates, incarcerated people serving longer periods of incarceration. Uh, what in your view needs to be done to correct the harms of truth and sentencing policies and address the needs of those impacted by long-term sentencing in Illinois? Well, I think that the Safety Act and the Pretrial Fairness Act did a lot of great things and it was yeoman's effort. I think it's one of the most progressive pieces of, of, of criminal legal legislation ever passed. But we have to be realistic that it did not change everything, right? And one of the things that I, I think that we still have lots of work to do is on sentencing. So the fact of the matter is that we need to repeal quote unquote truth and sentencing laws. I, I, that that language is 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 is, is very annoying, right? Um, but we we need to really think about um, how we can um, reduce incredibly long sentences, and we also need to think about how we can slow down people from even going to prison uh, in the first place. So you know, thinking about how we can actually bring back parole thinking about how we can reduce the amount of time people spend um, and really thinking about, you know, it, it's so random uh, how people actually get their sentences. We, we think that judges have this magic sauce that they are thinking deeply about how long somebody should go to prison when in reality, it's just a guess, right? And there's nothing in the system currently that checks that back, right? There's not a judge is not saying, oh, I think this person will become a better human in 14 years, or I think this person will be able to serve his or her community in a better way in nine years. It's a number that we pull out of our hat. And we have to really think about how we can bring back parole and how we can just stop the this the spread of these quote unquote truth of sentencing uh, types of sentences uh, throughout the whole criminal statute. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add on to this is um, one of the more annoying things in, in sort of a broader neoliberal context here is the term evidence-based practices, because um, you hear it all the time, particularly in education, you know, an evidence-based practice, evidence here, data here. Um, and yet when we actually think about how um, especially tough on crime exists, is it's completely divorced from anything that I feel like is actually evidence-based. And yet people who will shout at the top of their lungs about evidence-based practices in education seem to go really silent, silent when it comes to our criminal legal system. And particularly when it comes to things like sentencing, um, I really see as an example here. Sharon's right. Um, oftentimes when we think about judicial uh, decisions, there, I, I sometimes, I joked about this with bail, but in general, they're not, pulling up an Excel spreadsheet with like a specific level of data points to make a decision. You know, it's not like uh, they're like, oh, well, I've calculated this thing. It's really sort of at the whim uh, of that judge. And then with truth and sentencing, as it's called, um, you literally lock people into uh, this, like this cycle that is horrible for them, their family and the community and has nothing to do with, I actually think about public safety or someone's well-being. but to go back to a theme I said earlier, and it's ultimately all about a game of politics and fear that come out of things that we saw, uh, particularly, I will repeat this, the Willie Horton ad as an, as an example of this. So um, on what we need to do, I think that I, I really wish we were able to get everything done in 
uh, the Safety Act. Um, you know, it is a it is a large bill, but we need to be able to actually get these things done in Springfield. And to go back to the first question you asked is, this is why people need to pay attention to what's happening in Springfield and get involved in Springfield. The more people are doing that, the more people are putting pressure there, uh, the more we can be able to actually organize together to get this done. It is, it is not easy to get this stuff done. And I can tell you on a health wise, uh, I am, I am shocked, you know, like I looked 15, but you'll be shocked. I was like 10 years old when I started. Um, and, uh, so it is, it's an extremely stressful thing and it's, um, with not a lot of people paying attention to it, it makes it sometimes even harder. Um, I personally find crafty ways to talk about a bill on the floor, um, because it, you know, you have to manage debate as well as manage your roll call. But I think this is an example where we just need to keep organizing. Legislator needs to keep organizing. That's myself. Advocates on the policy side need to keep organizing. And of course, uh, people who literally organize on the ground and also bringing that community into Springfield because it seems like it's such a great distance. And whatever we can do to reduce that distance for people uh, who are on the ground is something like, whether it's busing or it's doing these virtual town halls, I think it's something that's needed uh, and to continue to push us to take the next steps to think of what could be a safety act 2.0 uh, to use that language. Thank you. Thank you both. I want to follow up with another question actually that relates to sentencing and incarceration. Um, and this question comes to us from the Illinois Prison Project who, um, you know, Robert, to your point about people leveraging evidence um, in, in the question that the IPP submitted to us, they seem to have marshaled some evidence. So here, here we have it. Of the nearly 28,000 people in Illinois prisons, 15% are serving sentences greater than five decades. Roughly 10,700 people are serving sentences greater than 20 years. These excessive sentences and the growing number of elderly people behind bars who pose no risk to public safety cost Illinois billions of dollars a year. Last year, the General Assembly empowered prosecutors to resentence incarcerated people and expanded access to sentence credit. Though these reforms reflect the urgent need to decarcerate, neither creates a meaningful pathway to review or freeze a substantial number of incarcerated people. Now, this is the forward-looking part. What reforms are on the horizon to reduce the number of people serving long sentences and what steps will you take to ensure that prosecutors offices and the Department of Corrections implement the reforms passed last year? And Robert, I'm gonna start with you and then Sharon, I'd like to hear your perspective on this as well. I mean, I would say, let's get to just quickly the implementation side. I mean, it goes to the fact that the one of the two things we can have in accountability is to hold things like subject matter hearings and to hold people account in front of us, the General Assembly. So that's always a thing to do, uh, particularly to be able to hold people accountable. So let me, I, I, I didn't actually realize that's something I should have said earlier that can kind of come back here, is the role of the legislator of being able to bring someone in front of us and to basically be able to, if we have to, grill them on the implementation. On top of that, um, on the sort of forward level, th the forward thinking piece, I mean, again, whether it's truth in sentencing laws and parole, um, we need to continue to pass pieces of legislation that get folks out of prison who've been there, you know, like for such a long period of time. Uh, we need to keep pushing the governor's office uh, to grant uh, commutations of sentences or clemency. Um, we need, uh, you know, we need to basically use a variety of levers from the executive branch and legislative branch, particularly with legislation and on the accountability side to be able to get people home uh, and to their, to their families. I think that's really sort of the best way to put it is the accountability, at least for us as a legislator that we do have the, you know, we can do, and it doesn't need to be in Springfield. We can literally hold a subject matter hearing at the Belandic building in Chicago if we have to, where you can get a little bit of a greater press or we can do these hearings and tour the state, which is another thing that people do. 
to try to hold some level of accountability and to dig deep on uh, the information that we need and combine that with the fact that we need to continue to push for uh, progressive pieces of legislation that continue to move us forward and you know, you know reduce the population within Department of Corrections. So I, I think there's, yeah, there's a variety of different spaces uh, in the legislative and accountability front uh, and as well as from the executive branch that we can continue to push on. Thank you. Sharon, what's your perspective on this? Uh, you know, I, I think the folks at IPP do incredible work and, and, and they, you know, they have a bunch of incredible stories, but that's what it's about. It's about stories and about narratives. And one of the things that is holding those types of reforms back is that typically a person who is sentenced to that long of a time has some sort of, uh, uh, you know, some type of shocking accusation of what they did. And, and, and legislators respond to that, right? We are in love with this idea of providing quote unquote reforms for first time, quote unquote, first time offenders and nonviolent offenders and, and, and people who just need a second chance. And in reality, we need to go much deeper when we're talking about reducing our prison population. You know, in America, we have this idea, we're comfortable with somebody serving 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, we push back on people who are trying to get out of prison after 30 years and 35 years, thinking about what they were accused of and we're caught up in that. So that's a culture war kind of that we have to fight. That this idea that, you know, these long sentences uh, just aren't right. You know, we have the data, right? The data is pretty clear that long sentences don't um, improve community safety outcomes, but the issue is the politics of it. And, and can we get our legislators to the point where they're able to say enough is enough? And I'm just not going to put somebody, I'm not going to stand for somebody being in prison for 30 or 40 years. Quite frankly, it's a fight that we haven't proven that we can win. Uh, I think the second piece is, is, is retroactivity. And that's been a big fight amongst, uh, you know, folks in Springfield, you know, organizations like ACLU of, of Illinois, Restored Justice, you know, IPP, you know, these folks, uh, you know, have been fighting for these type of reforms like retroactivity. And, and that is, if we pass something now, it should apply to everybody who's still there, who's, you know, serving sentences um, currently. And, you know, that is one of the key battlegrounds. You know, we did a little bit of that with some of the cannabis legislation, but that's something that should apply, I think, to a, a greater uh, pool of folks who have been accused of and or convicted of, um, you know, offenses. And, you know, let me add on this because I think there's actually an important part and um, I'm having a, 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 someone who's attending told me that I say Willie Horton so much that they, uh, they might take a shot every time I do it. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but I am going to say politics again. So if anybody's paying attention on your board, I'm going to say politics one more time, which is um, the Prison Review Board, PRB, uh, has become a outlet for uh, folks in the uh, Illinois Senate, particularly on the other side of the aisle, Republicans to basically attack the governor over and over again. I mean, they're just going at the governor at, for a PRB over and over again, even though the governor, whatever you have to say about PRB, he's trying, at least it's short term for him, he's trying to do um, some really good stuff to reduce the prison population. But at the same time, him doing that, and then it gets attacked over and over again by Republicans, by uh, particularly in the Senate, then that undermines and hurts all the other work we're trying to do um, in terms of reducing the prison population through legislation. Because that means every time we're on the floor trying to do some work and PRB comes up as a place to be attacked or the governor gets attacked for this, it's really trying to attack all of criminal justice reform. It is using that to attack everything. And what's interesting here is to go back to our um, previous conversation to rarely report it. It is not something that's being reported out in terms of the politics being made um, in terms of attacking uh, PRB and the release of folks uh, from prison. And this is going to, it's, it's a signal being made by uh, the opposition uh, that they're going to use that in 2022. This is they're signaling, they're like, it's like bright in front of everybody. And the way I always feel like this works is that in the summer of 2022, people will go, 
can, can you believe this is happening? Where did it come from? And it's been something that's been actually in the works for, you know, 12 to 16 months. So that is a thing that we need as people doing this work is to be very aware that in Springfield right now, they are using the prison review board to go after the governor and to go after the legislature broadly and to slow up any changes we try to do to bring into committee or bring on the floor. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask a question about retroactivity, um, though, Sharon, I know you just touched on it. Um, and this is like a, so we can, um, you know, if you want to add more, um, but so basically this is also from PNAP and this question talks about how past politicians have boosted their careers by pushing tough on crime sentences, um, rationalizing that those sentences would, sentences would deter crime. We know now based on multiple studies that harsher sentences don't deter crime. Isn't it, and this, this, this question goes, isn't it the responsibility of present politicians to correct for the mistakes of past politicians? And doesn't that mean that all reform legislation should be retroactive so as to provide relief to people who have been subjected to overly long sentences based on now discredited beliefs? So one thing that comes to mind is the felony murder rule, which was tweaked, um, but how that's not retroactive, right? Um, but I guess um, this question is kind of stated more so like, well, it's stated in a way, it's a, it's a bit of a leading question. I'm gonna venture and say these folks do believe that uh, it is the responsibility of politicians to correct past mistakes. Um, but as far as that question about um, legislation being retroactive, I guess, um, can you tell me, are there any efforts around, around that to make something retroactive that passes part of this bill that maybe helps folks moving forward, but, uh, you know, you know, um, but, but you know, now we want to help folks who are maybe still serving these long sentences. Um, is there anything brewing around that? You know, it's been a constant fight, and, and there are folks that are actually watching this uh, 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 piece right now that have been fighting for retroactivity for quite some time. So it has been a fight. Uh, you know, quite honestly, the, the, the state uh, uh, states attorney association. Um, organization of state's attorneys across the state uh, have fought retroactivity tooth and nail. Uh, they, they make constitutional arguments, they make morality arguments, they make policy arguments, and it has been a fight for a very long time. And, um, you know, to, to, to Robert's point, this is, I think, a political question. And it's a political fight that we uh, have to, 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 to win. And, and, and it, is, it has been difficult, um, again, because there is such a culture of fear mongering. There's such a culture of, oh my God, this person was accused of such a horrible crime. How could you let this person out? Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how the fight is going. Um, it is, it's, it's a focus. And, and I think there are folks in Springfield trying hard, but the struggle continues. I think Sharon answered that pretty clear. I mean, to be honest with you, I think you just answered it clearly. I mean, Retroactivity is something I think we all want uh, and we want to get done. But um, I mean, to be confronted with the truth, um, we don't. We just don't actually have the power yet. Um, I think that's something we have to be confronted with. I mean, that's something that I, I think about uh, constantly about the work that I'm doing is, do we have the power for me to do X, Y, and Z? And that's something I have to always be challenged with. So I would, I would fundamentally say, um, like this is a conversation around power and a sense of fear, um, but it's also something that we keep keep trying to fight to get done. And um, yeah, that's the best I can say in, that, in this situation. So it's not really politically viable or possible at this point for you all, given the power dynamics, that it's easier to say moving forward, we want lock, you know, those folks up in a certain situation, but. For all those people who are currently locked up for that, they got to stay there. So it's well, I actually I'll push back on that. I think that you should not actually necessarily operate that way. Um, you don't know, like again, with the Safety Act is an example of a thing that we got done. You don't know what uh, moments and crises and roll call can do. So you can't 
fundamentally say that. What you could say is the challenge and the, the barrier you have to keep breaking through is to be able to get to that 30, 60, and one. That is a fact. So it's I, I am not one of those people who thinks like what is realistic and isn't realistic. It's fundamentally the question of can we get 30, 60, and one. Now you put that out there and you continue to build and you continue to organize and then you, um, you, you, you can maybe make that breakthrough. And then you combine that with the fact that in fact, crisis is opportunity and it can be, it doesn't need to be a cynical, like horrible, you know, sort of Friedman-esque or whatever you want to put it, way of looking at it. It can fundamentally be an opportunity for very good stuff. And that's what the Black Caucus pillars came out of. It came out of a point of multiple crises. So I, I, I don't know if I would say like, it's not necessarily politically possible. What I would say is an extremely tough hill to climb and it's historically not been something we've been able to get done, but to, to immediately say something's not politically possible almost means that becomes something that does not become engaged. And to me, it's not, that is not the question is, it, it's not um, not to not, it's not to not engage it, but to actually engage it. And then to constantly challenge yourself to say, do you have the ability to get your 30, 60, and one? And I mean that by saying 30 in the Senate, 60 in the House, one is the signature by the governor. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a great that. point, but go ahead. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's, it's okay. There's so many worthy questions. So I just want to be sure that we're getting through them as I, and the time is, is uh, flying by um, as I thought it would, because there is so much to talk about, but I want to ask another question. And this may also venture into the realm of what is not politically possible. Um, as promised, we have been monitoring the, the questions that are pasted in the, pasted in the Q and A. And there's one question um, that overlaps substantially with a question that we got from, uh, from an organization. So, so the question that was submitted by one of our audience members is, is there more work to be done at the shallow end of the criminal system? Many people, myself included, believe that Illinois sentencing laws punish too many low-level crimes like drug possession and shoplifting as felonies. Doesn't a person's initial entry into the criminal legal system make it much more likely that they will be drawn deeper into the system later? What policies should be enacted to help solve that problem? Okay, that's the policy question. The law corollary comes from the Better Government Association. In Illinois, possession of any amount of a controlled substance is an automatic felony, including possessing less than a gram of heroin or cocaine. Other states, such as Oregon, have implemented laws that decriminalize the personal possession of hard drugs, making possession a misdemeanor or ticketable offense. Why were these measures not included in the criminal justice reform legislation? And do you support those measures for future legislation? Why or why not? Senator Peters, you wanna start with this one? Yeah, I feel like I'm obviously the one that goes to this. I just wanna thank the anonymous person who decided to bomb the chat and the Q&A for at least not saying anything racist, um, but uh, really was expecting to see this go to another level. But I appreciate that they were just a regular a-hole until not to curse and like this. But um, yes, I mean, of course I support this, this bill. I think that one of the things is um, why I can make in the Safety Act is one that I don't know if I can really sort of truly get to dig deep on explaining that. I think that there was a lot in the Safety Act, um, and I think it's just a combination of, you know, uh, it, it's like hard for me to really sort of dig deep on why it didn't make it in the Safety Act. My feeling is, um, I mean, I feel like it might have been a combination of organizing and timing uh, that played a role here, um, but of course I support this. I. Um, you know, I've, I fundamentally really focus on mostly the pre-trial piece more than anything, but um, yes, I think this is like, there's a whole host of things we can get into what didn't, didn't get into the Safety Act, but um, it, is, it is always a level of disappointment and a sense of responsibility on my part uh, when we don't get, the thing, the, get more pieces of legislation inside of that package. Um, but what I can tell you um, is that I would support this uh, through and through. 
yeah, you guys probably know my answer. I, I would absolutely support these things and some of these things I've actually worked on. Uh, there's a there's an incredible coalition of folks that have been working uh, to reform our approach to uh, possession of uh, controlled substances. They have been very effective. Uh, it's a combination of folks of uh, both from the organizing community and from the policy community, and they've been fighting very hard to change these laws. So you know, hopefully, it's just a matter of time. And, and I just want to continue. Uh, to lift up what Senator Peters said, I, I think I may have borderline on something that was not correct. You know, things are not politically possible until they're politically possible. You know, you know, ending cash bond and totally restore, re, um, you know, reforming the pretrial justice system wasn't politically possible until it happened, <laughs> right? And, and it did happen. So, um, you know, uh, I, I'm hoping that we will see uh, changes to uh, uh, our, our, our drug code. Uh, there has been a very, very strong resistance, um, uh, and, and most of it has centered around this idea that there are certain drugs that are so dangerous uh, that we can't do anything about it. Um, that is kind of, quite frankly ridiculous. There have been other pieces of resistance that jails are the place where people get services, where they get drug treatment, and that has proven to be completely false. In fact, we know actually that jailing folks is actually likely more dangerous, that it actually kills people, it drops their tolerance, and people get out and they use again and they die. So um, very vibrant coalition that have been working on that. Uh, my former organization, I, Illinois Just Project, has been a part of that coalition. Other great uh, organizations within that, uh, ACLU of Illinois, among others, Shriver Center, um, some great health folks in those coalitions. So let's hope that some of these things get done. I mean, there are probably 50 things that didn't make the Safety Act that uh, people have been fighting for. And hopefully it's only a matter of time before we get the vast majority of them, if not all of them, in. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go to another question from our audience here. Um, folks are talking a lot about uh, parole legislation uh, that Senator Peters may be co-sponsoring. Um, and then can you please help pass SB 2333 and other parole bills? Uh, Robert, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, we need to pass parole. Um, I think that, um, and I think I want to give credit to the people organizing around parole because, um, you know, there's a lot of competing thoughts around parole and they actually sort of came together to find an agreement um, in terms of the legislation, um, which is something that I care deeply about. Oftentimes you have organizations pitted against each other and legislators like to, to be frank, this is my most blunt thing, I'll say to pit them against each other, then therefore you don't have to do anything. But what uh, I think a good legislator, especially one coming from the movement and one in governing power, is actually bring those pieces together and say, if you actually can make these things come together and work, you have a stronger coalition to be able to get the work done. The moment mm -hmm. someone backs out of that, you have problems. So I, yeah, I think that where we're at is, um, you know, I know the pro Illinois folks are doing a lot of work. I just had a meeting with them. Uh, I'm pretty sure this question was from Katrina. Um, and, uh, they were talking about how they were doing the roll call and they keep doing the roll call. And I think, uh, as they keep doing that and they keep putting the, the pressure where they need to put the pressure, um, it will open up. Hey, she just put it in the, um, chat. So don't look at me. I'm replying. Um, but I think that is a real actual, um, and there's an opportunity to maybe, this is an example of the idea of something that you don't think is necessarily possible becoming possible because of all the hard work on the, the roll call and the fact that it's a coalition of folks doing work um, both on the inside and outside game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's going to be an uphill battle. Everything I honestly think I'm going to be very clear because of the next 16 to 18 months where we're at because of next year, everything we're working on in this area is going to be very difficult. But that does not mean you don't actually just keep pushing and finding those opportunities. We have to do that. And I think that's what we're looking at in terms of veto, uh, especially veto over next session, is to try to look for those opportunities and, and hopefully we can make it happen. 
Thanks. I might have missed this. What exactly does the legislation you're referring to, what, what exactly would it do? So it institutes parole. Um, and originally there was a com competition of instituting parole only for people of a certain age, uh, but it expands beyond that. Um, but it would, it would create a parole, a parole board, uh, one that then doesn't have to be at the whims of, say, a governor, um, and you don't have the situations that we currently have with PRB. Um, now, there are some more sort of minute details we need to get into, which was um, that I need to actually actually learn more about. Um, but Katrina sort of got in there when I was talking about uh, how people might have some concerns to, uh, that are a little different than what you would see in like a state like Texas. Thank you. Um, Juliet, can I go to another one or do you have the other one? So um, this new law, it, it creates a process, for, and this is actually a question from Reform for Illinois. Um, the new law creates a process for the State Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board to decertify police based on misconduct allegations, and it provides for a database to hold all the information of the cases under the board's purview. Seems like a lot of good information and important information, but then it bars the public from accessing that database, um, making it difficult to evaluate whether the board is doing a good job or really ascertain much else. Why did this happen? And are there any plans to fix it? Um, I mean, I'll just say fundamentally, I, I did not do a lot of work, particularly on decertification. I spent a good chunk on other parts of the bill. Um, I can't actually get into exactly why that happened, but my guess is that was a combination of negotiations that happened. And that's sort of the, the sort of best answer I can give. Um, I, I wanna be clear and transparent that um, getting into every part of it, um, you have to know your strengths and necessarily your, your weaknesses here. Um, and I, I know that I only had so much time and a large part of the bill that I felt like I had to carry. So that's really the answer I can give. I would say that um, there are other folks who you know worked on this issue that folks can talk to about it. Um, it is still a huge step compared to the rest of the country, but I understand the transparency concerns. I believe um, a, a few of us had conversations, maybe with you all at Injustice Watch actually about this. Uh, I was I think it's Injustice Watch or Southside Weekly. Um, Sam Stecklow wrote a story for us, and he's so, yeah. yeah, so um, and I understood his concerns completely, and I get that. What, whether we go back uh, to, to fix that, I think that we're going to be in a constant state of having uh, both positive and negative tinkering that could happen to these bills that we need to keep an eye out for. I think this is an area where we need to continue to sort of um, see applied pressure uh, to, to, to make sure that the changes can be made to bring more transparency. That is a very real and valid thing as we move forward. I'll add one thing um, to this. I'm sorry to jump in. Uh, you know, I also did not work uh, much on the policing, um, but I was kind of aware of it. And I will just say I'm a one trick pony. I'm sorry, guys, but um, I think you saw much stronger you saw advocates do better in the pretrial space, right? Because again, there was a strong coalition that was statewide that combined the faith community uh, with kind of traditional insiders, with outsiders, right? With formerly incarcerated folks telling their stories, you know, rest in peace, peace to Malik, uh, Malik Aleem, who was super, super, super uh, uh, effective at telling his own story about how he was caught in a county jail. Um, you didn't have that, I think, um, grassroots structure in the policing space. Now, I think that was because I think that policing work has typically happened at the city level. And you saw a lot of that grassroots efforts working on CPAC and, 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 and those issues. But at the state level, I don't, I don't think I particularly saw that strength. Um, and I think there was another interesting point in the chat that I wanna lift up is that, um, you know, when we focus on policing, we should be talking about correctional officers as well, right? Because that's where you can see even worse abuses that are even farther away from the media centers, right? 
And those things can just go, things can happen, you know, at a downstate prison where we just don't hear about it. And there are these kind of voices in the wind that are yelling and screaming, they're doing such a great job, but aren't backed up. Um, so yeah, on that piece, that, that, those are my thoughts. Yeah, and I just want to add what Sharon said because I, I don't want to be the politician who's like, well, we got to keep organizing. Like I'm doing that, but trying to say like, I play a role in organizing, but I do fundamentally, I get frustrated that we don't organize outside of Chicago. Like there's some people, there are people doing work throughout the state in the Metro East area, in Champaign-Urbana, in Springfield, Peoria, Rockford, right? There are literally people working at Bloomington Normal. They are doing the work on the ground. And yet there's not always this sort of connection to people doing the work in Chicago, because again, more people tend to focus on what's happening at City Hall. And I think it's very important that you organize a statewide coalition. It is so important all the time. Yes, I feel like you're telling me I need to wrap up. And I'm gonna wrap up real quick. Oh, oh. I'm, not, I'm not actually. Oh. <laughs> I'm actually picking up where you left off though. Because, because the, the very next thing I was gonna ask you was about these issues outside of Chicago land. And you know, and, and I, it, it's appropriate that we that we discuss that before this evening comes to an end. Um, so you know, we've gotten two questions about this in in the Q and A that I want to to um, to bind together. Um, one of them is from uh, Alan Mills, and one is from Larry Evans. So Alan says the issue of implementation is heavily dependent on public defenders. And by the way, he's referring to implementation of the Safety Act and specifically the, the pretrial release aspects of it, and as well as other aspects. In Cook County, Alan says, we have Sharon and his team, but it seems much more difficult downstate where there are part-time contract public defenders. Should there be some, rec some reporting requirements regarding who is released and who is held? And the related question that I wanna include appears to come from someone outside of Cook County. What are the steps in implementing court watching on the county level? What do I do to make this happen for my county? Um, so on, on that piece, there is an incredible coalition, the Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice. Uh, these are folks that have worked together to, to uh, conduct court watching in multiple counties. I would suggest that you reach out to those folks. Uh, you, can, you can Google those folks. Um, you know, on the public defender piece, I, I don't want to act... I love Alan. I don't, I don't want Alan to think that we got this thing held down, right? It's going to be a lot of work for us here, here in Good County, and, and we're going to need some more support uh, to do that. So we're, we're currently engaged in a budgetary fight, and we're hoping to get the support that we need uh, uh, to continue to do this work. But, you know, there have been discussions, there, there is a report, reporting requirement uh, in the Safety Act that exists. Um, you know, Siege is going to be, I believe, in charge of doing that, but we need to make sure that they do it. Um, you know, one of the problems that we've seen is that there are many counties that, uh, that, that, that are saying that they don't have the ability to do that. And, and there is a kind of a task force that's going to be looking at uh, doing that work. Um, but I think we need to have a conversation about how we fund public defense, both here in Cook County and here across the state. Um, you know, the Cook County Public Defender's Office accounts for like five or six percent of the county's violence prevention, uh, sorry, the, uh, safety, public safety funding. Uh, you know, the, the sheriffs, the clerks, the, uh, uh, you know, the state's attorneys all get significantly more funding than the Public Defender's Office, and it's likely worse all across the state. There have been conversations about a statewide network. Of, of, of public defense. There are pros and cons to that, but we need to be having a conversation about how we fund uh, public defense because we can talk about these laws as Alan insinuates, um, but they don't mean anything but ink on a paper as long as we don't have, uh, if we don't have a strong advocate sitting next to that young person, whether it be a man or, or a woman uh, or, 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 or anyone, uh, sitting next to them and, 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 and defending their rights. Thanks. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, I want to throw in another question from, and Jess is watch his own, Maya Dukmasova, who, who asks, well, one of the Safety Act provisions is that all law enforcement agencies in the state equip their officers with body cams by 2025, and, all caps, and, 
there's state funding for agencies to buy the equipment. What do you think about downstate law enforcement agencies already claiming this is too expensive for them to do? Will the money provided by the state cover 100% of the costs? So a question about um, the folks of claims unfunded mandate of uh, requiring um, body cams for officers across the state. Um, so let me first say there are so many people who um, first attacked on the cost front without realizing the appropriations front. So I would say it wasn't necessarily a good faith attack to begin with, and that's still not a good faith attack often. Um, depending on the size of the police force, it uh, depends on how much you're going to be able to afford from the grant program to be able to cover the cost. So it, again, it's dependent on the size of that police force. Uh, but for a lot of folks who have a lot of very small uh, cities or towns, um, they're not even trying to go and get that money that's been appropriated for them. So it's really just a, uh, a talking point similar to how they talk about bond where they didn't actually know the appropriation existed in the first, they didn't even know it existed before we added to the appropriation so that they could get the body cameras. They, they, there was actually already money in the grant program beforehand. Uh, I can't remember if it was 2.1 or $3.1 million at the time, but they still attacked about how they didn't know, they didn't even know that existed while they attacked the body camera law. So that is just um, often for downstate or not, it's not just downstate, for smaller police departments, was often the um, the go-to talking point uh, and to attack it on a quote-unquote unfunded mandate until we made it clear that that is actually something that they can go and get. Uh, Senator LG Sims loves because he's he not only did he work on this, he's also the chair of the budget committee in, um, he's, uh, in the Senate. So he uh, made it very clear he understood the budget here. Um, and it's again, just a it's a good old fashioned example of um, folks hitting, trying to hit at a talking point, even if they don't understand the facts of the bill. Or as, as we say about, uh, oftentimes a lot of talking points about the bill is that they didn't read it, nor did they read anything about the state budget and nor did they ask people about the state budget. And I think there's an open question, there's an open debate about uh, the, 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 the existence of body cameras. Uh, there's a critique that giving police money for body cameras is feeding into the carceral state. Um, I, I think we should acknowledge that uh, discussion. With that said, with, with body cameras, which you know, I personally, from my perspective, I, I, as a as somebody who who govern, you know, who, who 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 sees lots of cases, that I can see it be advantageous. Uh, what I would like for it to be at, to, what I like to be added is that an exclusionary rule uh, attachment to body cameras. We see videos every day at the public defender's office of officers acknowledging the fact that they are on body cameras and clearly changing their behavior because of their own body cameras or we see body cameras go dark when there's a key situation um we believe i think that lots of us believe that you know there should be some type of exclusionary rule you know if you violate the fourth amendment that you can't use a certain piece of evidence against the person who was accused uh we should be thinking about that same strategy if we're going to be bringing in body cameras all across the state, if officers violate folks, people if they try to skirt the body camera rules, then we need to be excluding evidence so that, um, you know, some of those uh, things don't happen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you another question from our chat, and I apologize for folks who've submitted questions through the Q&A thing here. We definitely got spammed with a couple hundred messages, I think, saying some not to uh, kind things. But uh, like Senator Peter said, nothing racist, which is, uh, you know, it's always a plus, nothing sexist, just, you know, same old. But anyway, this is from Mark Clements with the Chicago Torture Justice Center. Um, do you think this legislation legislation will help expose police misconduct and torture? If so, can you explain how? And this is first directed to Sharon, but uh, Robert, you can jump in too. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that um, we do have a bill um, to try to expand the Torture Commission uh, to being statewide and not just Cook County. 
um, to explicitly focus on uh, torture survivors, uh, particularly those who are incarcerated, uh, and then a hope to expand the appropriation to fund that. Um, and I think that's an important piece of legislation that is very specific to police torture. Um, and to understand that police torture is not just it's not just John Birch in Chicago. It happens in every uh, municipality and in the state. Um, so uh, that is an area of, I think, opportunity to be able to expand this uh, and to really focus on that. Um, and so that, that's, I think that's the way I can answer this. That's what we have to do and get done. And that's something that we're working on. And um, I have to take credit the coalition that's been working on this. Um, they've, they've gone out, they've done meetings. Um, they've taken my advice on the inside outside strategy of the, uh, um, the, the money bond work, um, and another actual opportunity to be able to get something done. And again, um, it's both expanding statewide and the appropriation side. Thanks, well, I'll, so I'll say that, well, go, go ahead and go to the next question. I know we got a lot of questions. No, 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 no. I was, I was going to actually make a joke. Somebody in the chat said, y'all need to do it tonight. <laughs> Uh, but I'll, uh, Sharon, say what you got to say, and uh, I know Juliet's going to take us home. Yeah, I'll, I'll say really quickly, it, like, I think the first thing we need to be thinking about is the footprint of the justice system, and anything we do to limit the um, footprint of the justice system, we reduce the risk that the, it's implicit uh, in its execution, so things in the Pretrial Fairness Act that actually reduce the power of the state to actually incarcerate people, I think will make improvements on that. I think the second thing that we are seeing that I think will have a little bit of an impact, I don't think it hits it on the nose, is giving uh, folks who are in police stations the right to three calls in three hours. Now, we know that the, the law enforcement are, are trying, to, trying to roll this back uh, as hard, like they're really, really trying to roll this back. And even if it stays on the books, I think the January 1st of next year is the effective date of 2022. Uh, even if it's on the books, we know that this is something we're going to have to watch at the Public Defender's Office around implementation. And we have some great partners that are going to help us with that. Uh, but I would just say reducing the footprint of the justice system, keeping people out of the system and the things in the, the, the Safety Act that keep things out of the system will assist that. And also, I'm really excited that at least people are getting uh, a more explicit right to uh, phone calls. And, and we're hoping to and see some improvements with that. So I'm committed to our ending on time, Sharon. I see that the, the, the window has gotten darker and darker. Darker uh, and darker. <laughs> uh, everybody, everybody needs to get on with their evenings. And so here's the closing question for both of you. And by the way, before I close this, you know, there's clearly so much interest. I want to thank our audience for coming tonight, for engaging in a constructive dialogue and substantive questions for both Sharon and Robert, and I truly hope that we can continue the conversation another time. But here's the last question for tonight. Uh, it's a crystal ball question. I'm gonna ask you both to look five years into the future. How will this legislation have changed communities across Illinois five years from now? You know, I, I, I believe that, that, that money bond was a tax on Black families, on Black women, on mothers, on sisters, on partners, on grandmothers. And I believe one of the biggest impacts we will see is uh, communities retaining those dollars. You know, Loyola University did a study that in, I think it was 20, I'm not sure the year, in, in a six month span, uh, there was $31 million that was paid out of communities for money bond. And there have been studies from the Civic Federation that show the numbers that are even greater statewide when it comes to the amount of money that accused people's families are paying out for money bond. So I think that is really exciting. I think the second thing that we're hopefully going to see is a significant reduction in our jail populations. Uh, there have been studies from um, uh, national organizations that suggested that if implemented in this time, if it's going to be implemented in this current form, that the Pretrial Fairness Act is going to significantly reduce the amount of people that are in jail. Um, with the reduction of pretrial incarceration, I think you're going to hopefully see more trial and hopefully you'll see better outcomes uh, for accused people. So in five years, I'm hoping to see a slightly 
better justice system, but I our legal system. But let's be clear: the fight needs to continue. And just by passing this law, we are forty nine percent of the way there, right? Implementation is still important, but more importantly, the, the injustice is so large. There are so many other things to attack. So if we're hoping to be better in the future, we need to keep it up. We need to pass more and more and more of these common sense changes that are going to make our community safer. Yeah, so I think for me, when I think about this stuff is we fundamentally changed or truly started to begin the change of what it means to have public safety in a community. Um, and that we have shifted from the hammer of criminalization uh, to actually having to focus on the tough and difficult task of providing people with the things that they need in terms of care. The other part about the Safety Act that I think is important is that we not only sort of attack the front end of incarceration, as Sharon pointed, but it begins truly going at the back end of people who are incarcerated. And if we can reduce both ends, we can fundamentally shift our criminal legal system and fundamentally shift uh, public safety. And so to me, uh, you know, Asked other pieces of legislation that I, I was proud to carry. So obviously now I'm going to kind of toot my own horn, but mental health first responder. And when you call 911, you get a mental health first responder. Part of the reason why we were able to do that is because, and now my, did my internet cut out? Am I good? Okay. Um, the part of the reason we were able to do that is because of the work that came out of the Black Caucus Pillar and the Safety Act. Um, and so to me, it's just, we got to keep pushing forward and using this as a building block. Uh, we've got to also make sure that those who are against the work that we're doing are always on the back, you know, they're on their back foot. Uh, that is a, me using a soccer term, but the idea is that you're always on attack and your best defense is the attack. Um, when we think about uh, the tough on crime crowd, they, it's a never ending barrage of reactionary bills that have nothing to do with keeping us safe and it just keeps pressing on a system that is extremely individualistic. I think this is our chance to keep doing the same thing on our end and to keep pushing forward. And the Safety Act was the beginning of that. You know, I speak for both Ade and myself on behalf of Injustice Watch. Thanks so much to both of you for joining us tonight, for engaging in this discussion. And I wish you all good night and goodbye.